Hello, and welcome to the 2020 Living Teal Global Summit sponsored by FAIR. My name is Brian Vickery. I'm a pediatric allergist uh, at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. I want to thank you all for joining us for this session and thank FAIR and, and the whole team for organizing this great meeting and for giving me the opportunity to present. My topic today is on standardized oral immunotherapy. I'm going to give a brief presentation uh, that will then lead into a facilitated discussion with my friends, Dr. Tom Casali and Dr. Richard Wasserman. A few disclosures before we get started. I'm an employee of Emory University, uh, but do some consulting for uh, companies in the space, including Amune Therapeutics, which is the manufacturer of the product that I'm going to spend most of the time talking about, as well as FAIR itself, the sponsor of today's meeting. Uh, I have some grant support and some clinical trial contracts as an investigator. I spend most of my time doing research in food allergy, but have no financial stake in the outcome of any of that research or of the commercial use of the product. Uh, what you see today is my opinion and my opinion only. I haven't uh, received any editorial guidance or compensation for the talk today. So in the next few minutes, uh, what we're going to discuss is an overview of what OIT is and isn't, how it works, what it does, and to share some of my perspectives about why I think allergen standardization is important in the field, uh, as well as maybe some future directions in OIT and food allergy research more broadly. So what is oral immunotherapy and how does it work? Well, what you see here on the left side of the screen is sort of a, a schematic representation of what it's like to be allergic from a threshold point of view. That, that squiggly blue line is the, the allergen threshold, which is squiggly because it changes uh, in patients day to day. Um, and basically, while patients are on an avoidant diet, if they're exposed to small amounts of allergen below that threshold, they won't have a reaction. Uh, and more than that, they will. The key thing to remember here is that um, these thresholds are very low, so, so patients are typically exquisitely sensitive. Uh, just a few bites uh, of the wrong food is enough generally to provoke a reaction. What the last decade or so of research has taught us is if we expose people deliberately to small amounts below that threshold, uh, to the thing that they're allergic to over and over again, what we do is we actually can shift that threshold up. Uh, such that there is a, a sort of a margin of protection. Now, the patient is otherwise still continuing to avoid the allergen. They're not cured from their allergy, but this difference in their threshold over time is what we refer to as desensitization. And we have been able to learn that this is uh, related to specific changes in the immune system. Two of the most important ones are shown at the bottom of the slide where uh, important allergic cells like mast cells and basophils become less reactive over time. And our B cells start to produce an antibody called IgG4 that has an important blocking function. Now, it's important to note that this clinical and immunological effect is specific to the allergen which you're treating. So in other words, if you desensitize somebody to peanut, you can expect an, a, a, a less sensitivity to peanut, but not to other foods that the patient may be allergic to, milk, egg, tree nuts, etc. Now, how does OIT work? I'm talking about standardized immunotherapy today, and that's an important uh, point right here um, that distinguishes standardized approaches. What you see here is a representation of sort of a wallet card with capsules, and this is more or less how the treatment looks. Uh, this treatment involves uh, very precisely measured uh, doses of peanut allergen uh, delivered in capsules uh, that uh, constitute the daily dose. So you get uh, some sort of wallet card that looks much like this shipped to your home, you put it in the refrigerator, and then every day you push the capsules through the foil, uh, empty the capsules into applesauce pudding or yogurt, and take it at home. Now, at, when we start the treatment, we start it in clinic. Every time we change a dose, we change it in clinic, um, but there are doses that are given at home in this fashion. What does the protocol generally look like? Well, it's in three phases. The initial dose escalation day, which happens in the clinic, the updosing phase, and then the maintenance phase. On the IDE day, the first day, the first dose of the, of the treatment is 0.5 milligrams, or about 1 500th of one peanut. Uh, and on that first day, we test several other doses uh, to get to a maximum of 6 milligrams. We then dispense the first kit of a 3 milligram dose that is taken uh, in the fashion that I described previously every day for two weeks. Then you come back to the unit. Uh, we increase the dose to six milligrams. You take that for two weeks as tolerated to 12, 20, and so forth, up this dosing ladder every two weeks uh, till you get to the 300 milligram maintenance dose, at which point you enter the maintenance phase. This generally takes uh, you know, somewhere between 11 to 14 uh, office visits over about a six month period. And once patients are on the maintenance dose, they, they can come less frequently. This is somewhat like we do with uh, allergy shots to cat 
uh, dust, pollen, etc. Now, the approach to OIT over the last uh, five or 10 years has sort of uh, you know, been diverged into sort of two approaches, the standardized approach and the non-standardized approach we'll call for, for the purposes of, of the discussion. And there's some important distinction between them. The standardized approach is FDA approved, uh, where the non-standardized sort of food, commercial food-based approach uses things from the grocery store uh, that are not FDA approved for the treatment of food allergy. In the standardized approach, the doses are precisely manufactured uh, where they can be much more variable in the non-standardized approach. One additional point about the standardization is the protocol itself, not just the product that's precisely manufactured, but uh, all the patients that are taking this product uh, basically stay on the same protocol. Whereas in the non-standardized approaches that are available in, in allergy offices, the protocols are quite different between, uh, between groups. Uh, the standardized approach has now been tested in several large international randomized trials, and we'll talk about that, uh, but there have been no, no randomized studies done of the non-standardized approach. Uh, there is uh, the ease of use and the manufacturing at scale allows access to the standardized treatment uh, potentially all across the country and maybe even across the world now, uh, whereas uh, currently, as best we can estimate it, about 250 or so of the 5,000 allergists uh, in the United States are offering access to non-standardized treatment approaches. The standardized uh, treatment requires a, a, a registration in a nationwide safety system to make sure we're keeping track of the important uh, events related to the safety of this product. Uh, and there, um, by comparison, we, we know very little about the safety of non-standardized approaches. Some groups report their experience, but most don't. Uh, the cost is quite variable. Um, the, the, one of the benefits of FDA approval is that it tends to be covered by insurance, uh, and this is not always the case for the non-standardized approach. Uh, and one important difference is that for the standardized approach, this is only currently available for a peanut allergy uh, in a treatment called palforzia, although there's a development of an egg product and tree nut product coming. Whereas in the, in the office-based commercial food approach, um, there are, there's access to to multiple foods, uh, potentially any food, uh, and that's available now. The standardized approach uh, sort of brings food allergy into line with kind of how we have treated uh, uh, allergic rhinitis over the years with allergy shots, uh, where we now have commercially available standardized extracts for cat allergen, dust allergen, grass pollen, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you know, historically, we did not have access to standardized allergens like that, but over time, uh, industry companies got involved and were able to standardize the product so that they could be rigorously characterized and tested. So we now know uh, how, how much uh, major allergen of, uh, say, for instance, cat allergen we need to deliver on a monthly basis to achieve the desired effect. Well, why is this important? Why is it important to even talk about this sort of standardized versus non-standardized approaches? Well, the first thing I would say is that, that this has been a, a landmark re regulatory precedent. Before the approval of Palforzia in January of 2020, the FDA did not really have a process to evaluate food allergy therapies for approval. There was no consensus on what clinical outcomes should be measured to determine whether a treatment is efficacious or not. Uh, and it was agreed that the double-blind placebo-controlled food challenge should be su sufficient to do that, nor how, uh, how much... Uh, statistical power is necessary to show a meaningful difference in these outcomes. And so these were important decisions that were made in the process of developing Palforzia. It wasn't clear that, um, that approval could be managed with an OIT product because of concerns about the CMC, a part of the, uh, the application, and that's uh, uh, control manufacturing elements related to uh, the precise characterization of allergen in each dose and each lot. And then um, the, you know, the, the process of evaluating this standardized treatment uh, involved insight from many stakeholders, which are setting important precedents that will be uh, relied upon later in the field, especially the Allergenic Products Advisory Committee that the FDA convenes, a, a group of independent experts that has advised them on, on how to do this. And so this, the aspect that the process of approving this treatment um, will both catalyze, meaning it will happen faster and, um, and accelerate, sorry, catalyze meaning it will, it will stimulate new growth in the field and accelerate meaning it'll happen faster, the development of new drugs. So this could be OIT products, 
but also non-OIT drugs. Uh, and so it's, it's hard to watch, uh, you know, a football game or something else on TV without seeing an ad for a new uh, injectable biologic medication for some treatment, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, cancer, uh, et cetera. And you see one here on the screen. Before long, you might see a commercial like that for a food allergy therapy. And if you do, it's going to be in large part because of the successes of this first treatment to get through this process and define what it takes to get to market through the FDA. And perhaps as, a, as in part as a result of the success of these programs, you've now seen an explosion in the research landscape with lots of products now being studied uh, and more to be planned. Some which build on the success of OIT and others which take very different approaches to the treatment of food allergies. It's a very exciting time uh, to be in the field. And many sponsors uh, and companies have gotten involved in food allergy that weren't involved in food allergy before because they now see that there's a viable pathway uh, to patients. And they all understand that millions of patients are out there uh, desperate for solutions. So it's important to think about you know, the process of, of research and development to get medicines uh, to clinic typically takes about 10 years and about two and a half billion dollars of investment. Uh, and most compounds fail. Uh, so this is a slow process that involves a lot of failures along the way to get to the first FDA approved medicine, which is where we really are right now in food allergy. So there's a lot in the pipeline, um, but it's gonna take a little while and a lot of effort to get uh, more through. Now, why, why else is this important? Well, the FDA clearly has the authority uh, to regulate OIT products and, and considers OIT products drugs. This is now sort of a precedent that they have set, and this is in their statutory guidance. It's pretty clear when you look at it. The FDA is the Food and Drug Administration after all, and so they have clear rules around when is a food a drug and when is it a food. The FDNC Act uh, defines a drug as an article intended for use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. And the Code of Federal Regulations, which is a statute that carries the authority of law, defines a biological product as a virus, a therapeutic serum, allergenic product, protein, or analogous product applicable to the prevention, treatment, or cure of a disease or condition of human beings. And it's important to note that um, these definitions refer to the intended use of the product in the, in the specific situation. And therefore, the FDA, for many years now, um, has considered that OIT to treat allergic individuals, even when it's a product that's traditionally considered a food product, um, is considered a biologic when it's used with therapeutic intent. So a, a food that is used to treat a disease is considered a, a biologic drug by the FDA Seber uh, branch. And this is a, des a decision that they made uh, some years ago. Uh, and this, this precedent is important. And when you look at these definitions, it seems pretty clear to me that uh, food used in the treatment of a disease meets the FDA's definition of a drug. So this is sort of an orthodox view, but this is an important um, uh, discussion you know, th between those that consider, you know, OIT foods drugs and those that consider them simply foods. The FDA has clear statutory guidance about this that, in my view, um, uh, classifies them as a food, sorry, as a drug. Um, now, um, there are other benefits of FDA approval, uh, and I think there are three main ones. Uh, this is my opinion, again. First is access. So, Having a product that can be manufactured at scale means now that thousands of allergy offices in the United States, uh, hopefully soon in Europe, the, the drug is currently being uh, uh, decided for approval by the, by the European Med Medicines Agency, and then maybe even potentially globally. Ease of use, I mentioned already before, and this is good for both patients uh, who don't have to worry too much about having to prepare their own medicines and for providers who don't have to spend time or resources on preparation. They can just treat more patients uh, because this has been taken off of their plate. And really, as a scientist, I, I'm, I'm most um, you know, excited about the potential for better data. So when we have thousands and thousands of patients taking the same product with the same protocol, we can compare data in terms of apples to apples uh, instead of apples to bananas to rice to bread, which is kind of the way it is now with all the different uh, products that are being used in all the different protocols and all the different offices. Those data just don't, you know, don't lend themselves to comparisons. But when you have everybody treated the same way, now you can start to generate the observations and the power to identify key unknowns about who are the best patients for treatment, um, who should really alternatively not seek treatment, 
and wait for something different? What is the best dosing regimen and so on? Is the treatment cost effective? Does it keep, keep patients out of the hospital? Uh, all these key questions that we still don't have the answers to. And in my view, food allergy patients really deserve no less than, uh, than the access to rigorously developed and tested medications, just like they do for antibiotics and uh, inhalers and all the other things that we use. So what do those uh, big, large uh, data sets look like uh, when you use a standardized uh, product and protocol? Here is the result of the largest food immunotherapy trial to date called the Palisade trial published in the New England Journal in 2018. What you see on the left-hand side of the slide is after 52 weeks of treatment, the difference between the active and the placebo group is, is significant with uh, two-thirds of participants treated with uh, active uh, AR101, now called palforzia, uh, were able to tolerate 600 milligrams of peanut protein without any symptoms at all at the exit food challenge compared to 4% in the placebo group. Uh, and uh, uh, half of them were able to tolerate the 1,000 milligram uh, last dose, which is the equivalent of about four peanuts, 600 milligram being two, two peanuts or so, 1,000 milligrams about four peanuts. And that's the sort of the between group difference between the active and the placebo group. It's also important to look at the within group difference. And here is a, a figure that shows sort of how on average patients did with treatment once they completed the therapy. And what you see is that uh, on average, there was a hundred fold improvement in that threshold dose. Um, so you treat patients with a 300 milligram maintenance dose for six months, and now uh, they generally have protection to the thousand milligrams. So that's another important point of the treatment. The, the maintenance dose is 300, but the protection is multiples of that. Uh, and this is, this is after about a year of treatment. Subsequently, more recently, a study was published uh, from the same, uh, with the same product in, in a European population where uh, the, the subjects underwent the same kind of testing with the exit food challenge, but now after only 12 weeks of maintenance. So about half the amount of time on maintenance, and you see remarkably similar results with 68% tolerating 600 milligrams uh, at, after uh, 12 weeks of maintenance and 58% tolerating 1,000 milligrams. So these results look even better than Palisade, faster. Now you can't talk about the benefits of OIT without the risks. Uh, so certainly we know most participants experience adverse events during uh, oral immunotherapy, typically involving the GI tract, skin, and respiratory symptoms. These are usually mild and moderate and typically manageable, but, but they can be severe. Uh, and there are two events that are most important that we want to uh, follow closely. Anaphylaxis, which has been shown to affect about 15% or more of patients uh, in these phase three trials, uh, as well as eosinophilic esophagitis, which was a rare event in the phase three program, but is currently estimated to affect about uh, two to 5% of, of those receiving OIT although it's important that this is likely an underestimate because most patients do not undergo the biopsies required to diagnose EOE. And right now it's unclear how to predict these events happening um, prior to starting the treatment. And that's an important uh, a topic for additional research with those thousands and thousands of patients being treated the same way. We know that uh, symptoms lead to withdrawal in between 10 and 20% of participants. The most common reason is for GI symptoms and typically this happens early in the treatment. Uh, it's important uh, that patients uh, follow dosing rules to minimize the, uh, the influence of these known augmentation or cofactors, even during the maintenance period. And we know that exposure to things like infections, uh, exercise, dosing on an empty stomach, uh, taking ibuprofen, et cetera, uh, and likely others um, are influencing uh, thresholds and can cause people to react to doses that they previously tolerated. Uh, and that sort of also implicates the importance of choosing the right dose, um, which has been uh, sort of a challenge to do with all these differences in the protocols. So is OIT right for you? Um, well, again, I, I, as I always uh, recommend, speak with your doctor. This is a very individualized decision. There's now some, some good sort of guidance out there uh, for you to think about um, from the American College and other sources, um, fair, uh, but ultimately this is a very personal decision and should be discussed with your doctor. So the key messages for today, food allergy is very much as, at, at an exciting inflection point in the history of the field, uh, where after 10 or 15 years of research, we finally have the first FDA approved treatment for food allergy. Uh, and that means that OIT for peanut allergy is poised to be a much more widely available treatment over uh, across the country and uh, starting to be around the world. 
We know that there have been two uh, international phase three clinical trials that show that OIT with palforzia results in high rates of desensitization and clinically meaningful improvement as soon as three months after reaching maintenance. But we know that palforzia has known risks and trade-offs and is not right for all patients. In my view, allergen standardization has multiple benefits and they are as follows. One, more patients can access the therapy. Two, that we will learn more and much more quickly about how best to use OIT when we have thousands of thousands of patients treated the same way. Three, it brings food allergy desensitization in line with allergy shot practices and the standardization of the extracts that we use to treat patients uh, with allergy shots. And lastly, the scientific and regulatory success of this standardized product will really usher in a new era of food allergy therapies that include other approaches to OIT, but, uh, but still yet new approaches that go beyond OIT. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I wanna thank all the participants uh, that have made these studies possible. Uh, they are very brave volunteers, uh, they individually and their families. I wanna thank my mentors that have helped me get to this point, uh, those that have supported our work, um, and you for your attention. Um, please uh, follow me on uh, Twitter if you like. Uh, and until we meet again, uh, please don't forget to wear your mask. So I'll turn it back over to Tom and Richard. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the Living Teal Global Summit. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to an interesting conversation. Uh, my disclosures are shown here. Uh, note that I'm gonna tell you about information that we've gotten from uh, treating patients and a retrospective rec record review of our uh, patients' activities. Uh, there's been no external funding for this work, uh, and I am a consultant for DBV. Uh, I need to acknowledge the people on this slide who uh, were instrumental in the development of our food allergy treatment program, uh, but most particularly, I need to acknowledge the patients and parents who, in an effort to improve their lives, courageously embarked on a treatment opposed by the allergy establishment. Uh, the learning objectives for the next 15 minutes are uh, to help you be able to discuss food oral immunotherapy with your allergist, to develop informed questions about how OIT relates to you or your child, to consider how OIT or food avoidance will best serve your family. The standard of care for uh, patients in North America with uh, food allergy is, call, is what I call the avoidance management strategy. Um, the avoidance management strategy, you're all familiar with it, carefully avoid the allergenic food by reading labels and avoiding risky settings, uh, be prepared to manage reactions, uh, recognize them and uh, treat with uh, epinephrine auto-injectors uh, promptly. Uh, the outcome of the avoidance management strategy, unfortunately, is that 12 to 35 percent of patients experience accidental exposures. Uh, there are more than 200,000 ER visits per year, more than 90,000 for anaphylaxis. Um, the annual rate of accidental peanut exposure is 12.6 percent, and unfortunately, Epinephrine is used in only about a quarter of the severe reactions when it should be used. Uh, and notably, most anaphylactic deaths occurred in patients who knew they were allergic to the food that killed them. Um, the psychological impact of the avoidance management strategy is also very significant. Um, there's anxiety apart on the part of parents and children, uh, anxiety about having a, a reaction, conflict with schools, other parents, friends, and family members. Uh, but for the child, there's a significant distortion of life, uh, social limitations and isolation. They often can't go on play dates or sleepovers because other parents won't take responsibility for them. They may be relegated to the peanut table. 40% uh, have been bullied. Uh, restaurants uh, and travel are out of the question for some 
uh, families who are very anxious uh, about their member family members' food allergy. Now, food oral immunotherapy was first reported more than 110 years ago. Uh, in the past 20 uh, or so years, there has been development of a lot of anecdotal reports in the literature, large case collections, and controlled trial literature on OIT. There are many different treatment strategies and specific protocols that have been used for OIT, very much like allergy shots. Uh, the goal at the Dallas Food Allergy Center is as much as possible to normalize life. Uh, we believe that desensitization significantly impacts family quality of life. However, desensitization means different things to different patients, and the treatment needs to be customized to the needs of the individual patient and family. Um, tolerance or sustained unresponsiveness is the holy grail of OIT, but is not necessary for improvement in quality of life. Uh, Last February, I surveyed a Google group of board, board certified allergists uh, regarding their OIT experience. 80 practices responded uh, that they had treated a total of more than 15,000 uh, patients with OIT. Uh, the process of OIT as we practice it uh, involves uh, teaching parents about OIT uh, so they can make informed decisions. Uh, both parents and patients hear about what the process of the treatment is uh, and what the risks uh, of reaction and GI symptoms are. Uh, we talk about the potential benefits, but also the, uh, the appropriate alternative approaches to managing food allergy. Uh, parents are provided an informed consent, and two weeks before starting OIT, we see the patients to make sure their asthma and allergy are well controlled. Uh, on the first day of treatment, uh, shown here on the left in the pre-coronavirus era, um, we uh, bring in the patients, uh, do an interval history and physical uh, record their vital signs, weight, epinephrine, and antihistamine doses on a flow sheet, and start dosing. Uh, before each dose, we ask the patient how they feel, uh, and we do up to 10 doses on that first day at 20-minute 20 mil 20 intervals, uh, and then uh, have an observation period that lasts at least two hours. Uh, after that first day, patients begin the escalation phase and they come back um, weekly uh, under most uh, circumstances, uh, weekly for a dose increase that is usually between 25 and 100 percent of the previous dose. When they return, we go over their interval history and make sure dosing has gone well with no problems. We give them their dose and then uh, watch them for 45 minutes before sending them out with the new dose. Once they reach their target dose, they begin maintenance therapy. At our center, uh, the target is uh, the liquid egg white equivalent of one whole egg, uh, four to eight ounces of milk, four to eight peanuts uh, per dose, and for tree nuts and seeds, an amount uh, equivalent to the amount of protein delivered by four to eight peanuts. Uh, we do uh, a fair number of multi-food uh, OIT patients, and when we have more than two nuts or seeds, uh, we aim for a target that's 50% of the standard because it gets to be just too many nuts for uh, a patient to eat on one day. Um, once they reach their target dose and begin maintenance, um, those patients who are receiving their full, full standard dose uh, are permitted to add that food to their diet in an unlimited way. Um, some patients elect to stop midway in the escalation uh, to a level that uh, we refer to as bite proofing, uh, and they need to continue to avoid their problem food. Um, nobody knows uh, exactly what maintenance should look like, 
<clears throat> in terms of the amount of the dose, the number of doses per week, nor how long maintenance needs to continue. Uh, the foods that we use for OIT are shown here, and it's notable that there are a variety of different food forms, and uh, under most circumstances, uh, we find that uh, the different food forms are interchangeable. You'll notice that there are um, seven or eight different uh, forms of peanut that we use and patients are permitted to switch from one to another. Now, uh, reactions do occur. Um, many uh, are mild, um, a few hives or uh, a mild oral itch or uh, mild stomach discomfort, uh, but everybody always needs to be prepared for a systemic reaction uh, that uh, needs to be treated with epinephrine. Uh, and <clears throat> so uh, the need for availability and use of epinephrine is reinforced at uh, every clinic visit. Uh, uh, this slide shows um, maintenance reactions that occurred in our population of peanut-treated patients that we reported a few years ago. And what you can see here is that more than 40% of the maintenance reactions occurred during the first six months after reaching maintenance. Uh, and unfortunately, at least 35% occurred because parents permitted violations of the exercise rules or didn't adhere to the dose reduction rules uh, for illness. Uh, nevertheless, uh, patients may have occasional reactions uh, more than a year after reaching maintenance with no uh, identifiable explanation. Um, this slide shows the reaction rate for the major foods uh, and what it shows is that for um, peanut, milk, and egg, there are approximately one reaction per thousand doses. That is an epinephrine-treated reaction, uh, one per thousand doses during escalation, and uh, approximately two per 10,000 doses uh, during maintenance. Uh, this slide shows our total OIT experience from uh, July 2008 until August uh, when I prepared this presentation. Uh, we've treated uh, 930 patients, 80% uh, of whom uh, have reached maintenance. Now, we've uh, had the opportunity to report uh, in the peer-reviewed literature our experience, and this is from our uh, most recent peanut paper, and what it shows is that there is a clear relationship between the degree of positivity of the peanut-specific allergic antibody, or IgE, uh, and age, and the likelihood of successfully completing OIT. Uh, so the older you are, or put it the other way, the younger you are and the lower your IgE, the better your likelihood of being successful. Um, but even in the older age group, a 15-year-old uh, who has um, the highest measured uh, peanut IgE uh, had a 50% likelihood of being successful. Now, the 20% of patients who dropped out, dropped out because of frequent cutaneous or systemic reactions. Um, many because of GI-related problems. Uh, taste aversion was a problem, especially for peanut-treated patients. Uh, anxiety on the part of the child or the family uh, has been a reason to stop. Uh, one unfortunate sibling developed peanut allergy while helping her brother uh, do his peanut dosing. Uh, OIT is a very demanding experience and requires a lot of office visits, and so some uh, families dropped out because of scheduling difficulties or they just weren't able uh, to keep up with the protocol. Um, I said at the beginning that I thought that desensitization improves quality of life, uh, and we did a small study uh, comparing uh, 24 patients who'd been on maintenance for at least six months 
uh, with historical controls. Uh, the higher the number here, uh, the worse the quality of life. And so you can see the OIT patients uh, had a quality of life of 0.21 and the controls of 2.8, a significant improvement in quality of life after OIT. So in conclusion, OIT is effective for most patients. Off-the-shelf food is safe and effective for food allergy treatment. Labeled protein concentrations are sufficiently accurate to establish clinical equivalent of different foods. Most of the time, different foods may be used interchangeably. Because of taste aversion and boredom, it's important to be able to use several different foods during OIT to maintain adherence. It's still a little bit of work. She does not like it. She eats peanut M&Ms. But every time we've come to see Dr. Sugarman, he asks her if it's worth it. And every single time she says, yes, absolutely. It's still... I, you know, I've referred a whole lot of people to Dr. Wasserman, and as many as will listen to me, I tell them about it because it's absolutely changed our life. I, I want to tell her. To learn more about OIT, visit the Food Allergy Support Team website, fastoit.org. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.